You know, when some comedians start off their set, they will say something like, let me tell you a little bit about me. Well, this is my version of that. Could I take out one of your face creams? Looking for a spot for my kombucha. If it's not kept cold, it'll keep fermenting in the bottle and it can explode. Oh God, fine, here, give it to me. Oh. You're right, it did explode. I'm bisexual, I prefer to date women. Men to me are like Las Vegas. I show up, I lose everything that I came with. I vow never to return again. And then six months later, I'm like, let's go to Vegas. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Helena Andrews Dyer, a pop culture reporter for The Post. And today I'm joined by actor, writer, and comedian Hannah Einbinder, who's here to talk to us about her work on the hit show Hacks. In addition to Hannah's second Emmy nomination, the second season of Hacks received a whopping 17 Emmy nominations. Hannah, welcome. Thank you for having me, Helena. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to jump right in um, before we really get into season two. Let's talk about the audition process. You were admittedly new, right, to acting before you landed this incredible role. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah. Um, so I actually went in to audition for Hacks in person. It was one of the like two in-person inter interviews I had ever really, uh, forgive me, interviews, auditions I had ever uh, really done at the time. A lot of them were just like self-tapes that I sent in. Um, I went in March 9th of 2020, uh, the 13th, the whole world shut down. and. Um, I didn't really know if I was going to get a call back. Things were in flux. Uh, the pandemic had just sort of hit. That was the initial date of the lockdown in Los Angeles. And so it took about two months to sort of hear if I was going to go back in. And eventually I did. The callback was over Zoom. Um, and <clears throat> sorry, I know we're on Skype right now. I don't want to start a, a beef. But yeah, no, we did it on Zoom. And uh, so it was really cool and um, also kind of low pressure, you know, because I was like in my own home. I think like auditions in these environments can definitely be certainly intimidating, but I think just because I was like sitting truly like literally right here when I did it, um, it was a little more comfortable uh, for me. And um, because of, you know, sort of the flux state of the world, things were kind of up in the air for a little bit. It was like uh, kind of like a month between every stage, a month or two. And then the final phase of the audition was a, an in-person screen test with Jean at uh, the Paramount lot. We did it on a dark, empty soundstage, which for those who don't know, a soundstage is essentially an empty warehouse where uh, film and TV productions will build the interiors of their sets. Um, so it was completely empty. So a full warehouse completely empty aside from like two like interrogation style lights <laughs> on Jean and I, and we were separated by like sort of a glass whiteboard, if you will, um, sort of on wheels. And uh, we just read two of the scenes um, and it was very fun immediately. And um, I felt the spark that we would later go on to sort of share uh, throughout the, the, the two seasons and um, took a couple weeks to hear. And then uh, I was just kind of walking down the street one day and I got a call from like a 917 area code. 
And uh, Paul, Jen, and Lucia called me, and they told me that I would be playing Miss Ava, and it was so fun. Um, it was the coolest, most exciting, terrifying moment um, because I was very excited, and then I instantly was like spiraling into <laughs> fear because, yes, as you said, I did not have any experience at the time, so it was crazy news. But yeah, that's kind of the whole process. Cool, exciting, terrifying that could describe so many of life's biggest moments, right? I think that's perfect. Uh, and that soundstage does not sound completely intimidating whatsoever. Um, but tell us about Miss Ava, you know, for the few people who have yet to watch Hacks and will watch it after this. Um, tell us about Ava. Who is she? So Ava Daniels is a 25-year-old queer comedy writer um, from Massachusetts. She got her start in the industry very young and gained a lot of success pretty early on. Um, and so I think she was kind of like isolated in that uh, on her path to success, kind of breaking away from a bit of a chaotic home life. And she sort of has an incident where she tweets something not so great and it causes her to lose work and sort of fall out of the good graces of the industry and the only person who will give her a job is uh deborah vance who uh she ava and deborah both share the same manager jimmy played by paul w downs beautifully i may add um <clears throat> and um ava's just like a really sort of um confrontational strong-willed flawed funny smart charismatic person and she's um, someone who I don't think who I think has a lot of growing to do uh, but I think she finds her mirror in Deborah Vance uh, they have sort of similar cores I would say as people and um, we sort of just get to see her grow and take two steps forward and one step back alongside Deborah and um, I think she's a swell gal love her a lot so and your connection to Ava, right? So Ava is a young stand-up comic and writer. You, Hannah, IRL, are a young stand-up comic and writer. Um, what similarities did you find with the character, right? The commonalities between you and Ava and what parts of the character where you're like, oh, absolutely not. That is, I I'm reaching deep into the archives for this. Yeah, so so Ava's Ava doesn't have she the, the the difference is that Ava is just a writer. She doesn't do Deborah is the comedian in the relationship. She's she herself is not a stand up. So there's a difference there. But I I think Ava. I mean for me personally, like I think she's maybe a version of me that didn't go to therapy. Like I could see like a lot of similar. Like you know she and I are both like queer comedy writers who have achieved a level of success at a very sort of young age. And so there are some surface level similarities there for sure. But um, Ava has uh, a lot of internal work to do. I have, I, I think like, I, I'm not someone who doesn't think before speaking. I think Ava just kind of comes out with everything. And fundamentally, I am like a chronic overthinker. Um, <laughs> so like truly have never like wanted to like put every word I've ever uh, said back in my mouth more so than when I'm playing Ava sometimes because she will just let it fly um which is interesting um but like I kind of love that about her too um but yeah I think like just that's like probably the the core of our our differences but I I mean she's written like a comedy writer so she's very familiar to me she reminds me a lot of the people that you know I came up with in the comedy scene and you know Paul Jen and Lucia also have a background in performing so a lot of Ava, I see sort of pulled from these various circles that Paul, Jen, and Lucia and I have existed in as performers and as comedians and writers in Los Angeles. So there's a lot about her that is incredibly familiar to me and incredibly authentic as someone who is sort of like a descendant of the same place, uh, the same sort of creative circle that she may have come from. So Ava is someone you could know, basically, yeah. like maybe sort of like on the periphery of a friend circle, 
perhaps, right? Um, you might be in a group chat with someone like Ava. Um, <laughs> speaking of um, the chemistry between you and Jean Smart, who plays the Deborah Vance uh, on the show, you talked about that and you said it was immediate. Tell us more about that because you two on screen, it's just, it's crackling. You two are so incredible together. Um, talk to us about that chemistry between you and Jean Smart. Was it, you, you say it was immediate, but how did it grow over the past two seasons? I would love to talk about our chemistry. I, <laughs> um, I it's the most immediate um, sort of, uh, and I think this is a credit to Jean, in a, in a big way because I have a feeling that like she creates such a warm welcoming environment for so many people and really everyone she meets that it's easy to slip in with her but for me it was one of the more immediate sort of warming up uh, experiences warming up to someone quickly um, sort of experiences that I had had um, I think like Jean has a really young spirit and I am a very old soul and that, you know, um, I think we kind of like meet in the middle there. Uh, and I just, I mean, let alone like, or, or putting aside like the fact that our sense of humors are like very, 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 very enmeshed and so similar. Um, she's just like such an incredible friend and like, we've just been very vulnerable and open with each other about everything in in our lives and within this show and so the evolution of our chemistry into like the most beautiful friendship has just been like very seamless because we both are i don't know just really like open people i think and like vulnerable and um don't really have a problem with like going there and love to go there so um it's just been like it's always great when you meet someone like that where you don't have to like try to like get in there it's like you're you're dealing with two dogs not not a, not two cats you know what i mean like it's sort of like we're really eager to like find that love and so yeah it's just been like one of the greatest most rewarding and uh cherished relationships i've had in my life so it's cool that sounds amazing i like especially in a, a scene partner and a creative partner to find that person is, I don't know, beyond ideal, I would say. Um, and want to get more into Ava's evolution as we've been talking about, specifically as it relates to her relationship with Deborah, right? Jean's character, because the Ava that we meet, as we say in the first episode, is not the Ava, um, not giving anything away on the second season finale and um, I want you to talk about her relationship with Deborah and how and how she's grown oh, I think she's grown. through that but first um, I want to go to a clip that I think perfectly encapsulates um, this just incredibly unique dynamic between Ava and um, Deborah so let's take a look I promise I'm gonna be better Deborah whatever you need to do okay Oh, well, I think you should take it. Oh. Hey, Jimmy. Hey there. So I regret to inform you that Deborah is suing you for violating your NDA. Wait, what? You're suing me? Oh, I can't discuss details of the case. Is this real? Yes. yes. Thick document. Real big. What? Haven't you ever been in litigation before? That'll be a good learning experience for you. Expensive one, too. <laughs> That's tough love right there. Like the toughest of love. Um, how would you describe your relationship, uh, Ava's relationship with Deborah? Oh, I'm just still laughing at big one. Thick document. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it's a little bit of a boot camp, you know. Um, Ava is this young person who has kind of professionally sort of glided through life. She's been talented and lucky in right place, right time, um, and certainly a hard worker. But she just kind of got off 
to the races very quickly at like a great big job. And then she was able to just build off of that. Whereas Deborah had to, in her own words, you know, scratch and claw to create a career for herself completely on her own with rejection at every turn. And so Ava has a lot to learn from that. And I think a big part of the development of Ava is dependent upon sort of learning from Deborah's path. And so, yeah, I think that, um, you know, that's sort of the foundation of, of Ava's growth. And, um, you know, there, it's not always, you know, Deborah learning or Ava learning from Deborah, excuse me. Um, there's definitely like a push and pull there. Like, I think Ava has a lot to teach Deborah about not only like, I don't know, the state of comedy today, like they definitely have things they can learn from each other. But I mean, it goes beyond that. I mean, like there are times where because they realize how similar they are and that they're coming from similar places, when one gives the other advice or when one asks the other to look in the mirror they're more inclined to do it because they understand that they both are coming from similar places, um, just like in a cent central sort of way. So yeah, I think um, a lot of Ava's development is is sort of tough love, as we saw in that last clip, for sure. <laughs> as you say, yeah, there seems to be like such a deep trust as, as we've grown over the two seasons between Deborah and Ava, I feel like at the beginning it was definitely like a hmm, not sure about this, and they've grown to just trust yeah. each other in a way that is really beautiful on screen. Um, and going back to what you were saying about sort of what Deborah can learn from Ava, another major theme on the show is sort of the generational divide, if you will, um, and the gap between the two of them, specifically as it relates to sort of comedic sensibilities, right? You have Deborah has some jokes that might not have aged too well, and a and Ava is, you know, of this generation of the now. Um, how does the show deal with sort of that gap between the two of them, specifically when it comes to like their comedic sensibilities? And do you think that can be instructive for viewers in a way? I absolutely do. I think that the show never attempts to legitimize one of their perspectives over the other fully. Um, if anything, it sort of sheds light on the flaws of both of their perspectives. Um, I think in any sort of meaningful conf conflict resolution or really any conversation, um, sort of casting aside the other person and uh, labeling them as bad or um, ill-informed or too sensitive or outdated is um, not necessarily a great way to attack any sort of uh, problem if your goal is progress or some sort of a re re rev, um, resolution. So uh, I think like the show does a great job of, you know, kind of letting them both have a little bit of egg on their face at times as it pertains to like their perspectives and that, you know, Ava isn't always right, neither is Deborah. So. Um, I have heard from folks from like various people who have told me like, yeah, this is a great sort of way for me to not just give up on my mother or my daughter type situations. Because I think like now more than ever, people are really struggling to see each other's perspectives because I think the world is changing so rapidly. And so um, I hope that a show like Hacks is a good model of, you know, people with a you know, 50 year, 40 year age gap, you know, um, just sort of like finding a way to coexist and beyond that, create great work or have a close relationship, you know? Yeah, I think that's part of what's also so beautiful about the show. Again, it's the bridging of those gaps is not just played for laughs constantly. It's literally like, OK, this is how you relate to someone, you know, who right. might not think exactly as you do. Um, let's zoom out a bit and talk about pressure. Um, specifically, you know, the show was a hit straight out the gate. Fans loved it. Criti critics loved it. All the Emmy nominations. Um, there's something called the sophomore slump, right? 
was there any pressure after that incredible first season um, to go above and beyond for the second season? Did you feel that pressure? And was that helpful? Was it stressful? Like, what is it like? Again, you talk about Ava being um, the character, you know, being so successful so young. Um, did that did that cause any pressure, any tension on set? And, and how did you guys use that as, as fuel? Mm. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I put an amazing, uh, a record-setting amount of pressure on myself um, as an artist um, to be, to do well. Um, so much so that I rarely enjoy, uh, am able to enjoy my work because as I'm doing it, because I am just putting myself through such hell. Um, I felt that pressure season one. And by the way, like the environment on set was so loving and egoless and collaborative and supportive and um, incredibly affirming, but because of my brain, I just couldn't hear it. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, so that's my shit and I'm working through it. But um, the whole, like, you know, the whole uh, time we were all just like, we had so much faith in the material. So we were all just like, kind of feeling good. I mean, I think as a group, I certainly looked around and saw the performances and the material being so much, like so elevated, surpassing season one. Like I was able to see it in my fellow performers, not so much myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like we all felt the pressure, but I, I think once we got the scripts, it was very clear that um, the gang had done it again. So yeah, <laughs> luckily. It and speaking of the scripts, talk about sort of, obviously there's so much talent in front of the camera. Um, everyone on the show is hilarious all the time, bringing their A game, but behind the scenes in the writer's room, there's so much talent as well. And you talked about getting the scripts. Um, what is it like to work with such, being a writer yourself, work with such talented writers? And as a writer yourself, were you involved in the writing process at all? Were you ever punching up scripts or? thought you needed to punch up scripts like Ava? How did that work? That, so, I mean, the writer's room on Hacks is filled with some of the most talented perform uh, performers, writers, individuals um, that I have ever known or known of. Um, it was, I mean, there, there's nothing, like for me, I just was like delivered gold. So, um, you know, it really was, <clears throat> just uh, such a masterclass for me, you know, on on writing, for sure. Um, being able to read these scripts and see various character developments. I mean, it's one thing to watch a show, but being involved in um, making it is truly the best education I have ever gotten. I'm sorry to the film school I attended, but um, it, uh, it really was a sort of masterclass at, at, at all angles, whether that's, you know, watching Paul Jen and Lucia work through things in the moment or Lucia's direction or just reading the scripts on my own or the actors around me. Um, our writers have just broken off little pieces of their hearts and sprinkled it in, you know? That's the best part about this show. So many people have given themselves and parts of themselves to the work, which I think definitely improves the quality tenfold. So um, it's just been such an honor. And I've gotten to like know these people because, you know, like it's pretty, in COVID, um, I don't know how sets were run before, but like I've been told that the writers will attend set and they'll hang around and, you know, obviously give feedback. And, you know, if they're, if it's their episode that we're shooting and that we weren't able to do that, there were no writers aside from Paul, Jen and Lucia on set the entire time we were filming. So. I do feel a little robbed of that because I think that would have been really fun, but um, I've been able to like hang with them and get to know them and DM with them and, you know, like just chill with them outside of work, which has been so cool. Um, they're all so talented and really sweet people. You make the set of Hacks sound incredible. Um, I think we all want to go and hang out there and live there for a while. 
Um, let's talk about the business. You mentioned Masterclass, um, but I want to talk about the family business. Uh, you come from a comedy family. Your mom, Lorraine Newman, was a founding member of The Groundlings and an OG cast member of SNL. And your dad, Chad Einbinder, is an actor and comedy writer. Um, did you ever want to be a dentist? Or <laughs> did you always know you were going to be in comedy? You know, I didn't want to follow in uh, sort of the business that they uh, experienced and were a part of. Um, I wanted to be a broadcast journalist, if you can imagine, such as yourself. Um, that was my, that was my whole thing. I was very into politics, very into news. I was obsessed with Rachel Maddow, which I think was a queer thing in retrospect, not necessarily a news thing. Um, but it could be both. I, it could be both. You know what? It's probably both. Probably more the queer thing though. But um, I mean, I just was so into the sort of MSNBC gang, you know, like Chris Matthews and Lawrence O'Donnell and Chris Hayes when he was a young reporter. I remember I've seen that young man uh, have quite quite the journey. It's very exciting for him. Um, but, you know, I watched them all and I, I realized in retrospect that those were performers. Like there is an element of performance when you're delivering a, essentially a giant monologue by a teleprompter and sort of selling it as if it's kind of off the dome, um, which I think Rachel in particular shines at. Um, so I kind of was headed down that path and then randomly got into comedy in college. Um, I, I tried out for the improv team. There was a young man named Alex Alsup. He was the president of the improv team at school. And he just like, I met him on like a student film set and he was like, you should try out for the improv team. And so I did. And then um, I did improv for two years. I didn't really love it, honestly. And then Nicole Byer, um, great comedian came to my school and asked if anyone from the improv team wanted to open for her. So um, I did, and I kind of got hooked on stand up that way. And then um, just naturally, like after school, got like a job at a coffee shop and just hit open mics every night um, and just started doing a lot of open mics. And then, um, you know, sort of uh, from there, there were agents and managers that would come around LA shows and I started working with um, agents and managers uh, from those live live shows. And then um, a couple years into that, they told me I should start, you know, sort of diversifying, auditioning, writing, things like that, doing things other than stand up. So I started doing that. And it was kind of like a really natural progression into this. Um, so I never really planned it. Um, I kind of, you know, had, a, had other plans. Um, just based on like sort of what my parents told me about the industry. It's very hard, you know, um, very, very hard. And so uh, I was very dissuaded from engaging with it or entering it. But this is probably the one skill I have. So <laughs> that's what I'm sticking with. And listen, it's a great skill. It's a great skill. Um, now that you have two seasons of, of Hacks under your belt and two Emmy nominations under your belt, um, have you caught the acting bug or is stand-up your first love still? Stand-up is my first love. Stand-up is definitely my first love, but I love um, acting as well. I mean, it's it's been so great uh, to learn that this is in the realm of pol possibilities for me. And um, I've just been so blessed to find this perfect gig and be like right for it and, you know, be able to get to be a part of it. So <clears throat> that was kind of the most um, shocking thing to me because I kind of had like sort of um, strict sort of boundaries or uh, binary ideas about what I was. I was like, I'm a stand up comedian. Um, and acting has really sort of opened up the realm of possibilities. And so I don't try to label myself as one or the other. I just kind of say that I'm a performer and um, that uh, I, I guess there's a lot extra and more in store um, when you just kind of keep it open and keep it keep it free, keep it yes, rolling. Keep it, keep it fluid, I like that. Um, last question, uh, and this is, I'm going to like zoom out for you. I'm going to give you a lot of options here, keeping it fluid. Um, who is the one 
writer, director, actor, or comedian uh, you would most love to work with next? Um, wow. I mean, I feel like maybe Richard Kind or Natasha Leone or um, the Safdie brothers would be cool. Um, yeah. Those would be my three answers. I know you asked for one, but I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's all right. Um, and, you know, we're going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. This was incredible. Hannah Einbinder, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, to check out what we have coming next, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com for more information about all of our upcoming programs and interviews. I'm Helena Andrews-Dyer, and again, thank you for watching.